when you heard that you had cancer, what was your first thought? I guess uh, this is, it was, I was in shock, you know, in, in a way, and I thought, okay, well, if this is it, then we'll deal with it, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a survivor. That was my first thought. You know, you go into a mammogram thinking it's just a yearly exam, and then you hear and get punched in the gut with, you have cancer. I guess I wonder, how long was it there? You know, and if I wouldn't have had it operated on, where would I be today had they not have found it? So it's, it's a mind game. It, just is something that every day I wake up, I'm reminded I'm a survivor. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about it. The mammogram is what saved my life. And had I not had a mammogram, I don't think I'd be here. I don't think I'd be standing here. I think everybody who gets cancer asks themselves that question. Well. <laughs> If I knew that, of course. Uh, some of the known are carcinogens, of course, are smoke, but that's not me. So uh, no clue as how I got prostate cancer. That's a good question. How do people get cancer? I don't know. I wished I knew. The thing is with, with cancer, as with other diseases or other conditions, but particularly with cancer, um, people want an explanation. Often patients will ask, why, why me? Why did I get cancer? Why didn't my father, my mother get cancer when she was 100 years old? I was always very healthy. It worked out a lot. You know, I don't think I really look overweight. I never smoked. I don't drink very much. I never microwave in styrofoam. I didn't use deodorant with aluminum, and I got it anyway. You know, I have that conversation with, with, you know, many people during the year about, you know, what is cancer, how does it happen, um, and trying to help them understand that, you know, our bodies are, are uh, you know, just miracles, uh, how they work and function for so many years without breaking down. We kind of talk about it at a cellular level and just how the cells are building blocks, and sometimes they go a little bit haywire. Every molecule's got to duplicate itself, split apart, and now you got two new cells. If you don't do that right, hopefully then the cell just dies. And the immune system is supposed to identify those and say, okay, you're in the wrong neighborhood, you don't belong here, you're sending out the wrong signals, and it can destroy those. And so that's supposed to be happening all of the time. So you've got all these cells that are multiplying, and then there's a mistake made somewhere and your body doesn't catch it. And now you've got cells that are you, um, and that's the other key thing, they're you, they're not foreign. People wonder why, how can that happen? It's because your body looks at them and says, well, they're part of me, so they must be okay. Um, and then they begin to not follow the rules. They, get, they start invading things that they shouldn't invade, and they hop in your bloodstream and go grow places they shouldn't grow. For most of the cancers, we don't know why that first step happens uh, or what causes it to happen when our normal cell changes into cancer. Those uh, steps will then allow us to begin to sort out why one person gets cancer and another person doesn't, but we don't have the links between the changes that we see in cancer cells that make them cancer cells and the environment that cause them to become that way. And that's sometimes hard to deal with for patients, especially the ones who have always done the right thing, who have, who have exercised, who have stayed healthy, taken care of what they eat, it's, it takes a while to wrap their mind around them, why it happened to them. I don't know that you can prevent cancer, but there's a lot of things you can do to lower your risk. The same things that your doctor tells you that'll lower your risk of heart disease, diabetes, and other things, also lower your risk of cancer. If you smoke, stop smoking. If you don't smoke, don't start. Eating right, getting exercise. Uh, increasing the fiber in your diet, decreasing the fat in your diet. I think those are the, the main points. And screening. I would say the majority of people who we diagnose with cancer don't have symptoms. I'm talking about breast cancer, I'm talking about uh, prostate cancer. Most of those are found with screening. 
There is a test done at annual physical, PSA it's called, and it's a blood test. And if it's elevated, they'll do a biopsy, which they did and after the biopsy. They said, yeah, it's cancer. So. Screening most of the time is really the best defense. That's something we can actively do. So um, you can prevent quite a bit of it. Clinically, cancer is a disease process. Philosophically, it is a devastating trauma that happens, not just to the patient, but to their family as well. Cancer is the enemy, and it needs to be done away with. Yes, I did think of it as an evil. Cancer is a very scary word. I, I think I denied a lot what it really was. I didn't have time to have cancer. I didn't have time to be sick. I had my family and my job. I think it sucks. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you just want it gone. It, you just go, something is growing inside of me that is nasty. I wanted it erased. I just wanted it gone. Oh, I think a cancer is just another hurdle in life. And for some of us, um, it takes us down. And for some of us, it helps, it takes us down, but helps us build back up again. For me, I think it was God telling me that I needed to slow down and enjoy my life. When my daughter wants to play outside, I put down the dishes and we play outside. I think I was just, it was my turn to take the walk. I was the chosen one, is the way I look at it. Happens to, you know, so many people and it just happened to me and I was healthy enough to fight it off. So, you know, I was glad that just statistically, I had to take one for the team for one out of eight or ten women who gets breast cancer. I, you know, know eight to ten women that I don't want to get it, so I, you know, was okay with that. I think your philosophy of cancer changes as you age. I think when I started as a new oncology nurse, I was very much into the war on cancer and fighting cancer. And this was what we did. We were battling cancer and helping patients fight. I think now I've moved into the idea that cancer is survivable. People do get well. You know, these days we know that one in three individuals will develop a cancer. And so it, it just is part of our biology. If you live long enough, you're going to get cancer, which I think should take some of the fear and demystify it a little bit. I was not yet 50 years old when the colon cancer was discovered, so I wasn't in line to have a colonoscopy yet. So we were surprised and shocked to find out that that's what I had. It'll be three years in September since my diagnosis. It's a long fight, but if, if you give in to negative feelings, you're not going to go forward. You're not going to react well with the chemotherapy. You know, you keep a positive attitude. You work with the chemotherapy, you work with the surgeries, you work with your doctors. You're gonna keep going forward. That's why I stay positive about it, is that we, we can do it. Uh, there's so many different kinds of treatment that are out there between surgeries and chemotherapy and radiation. And I've had all three and I'm still going. I'm in it to win it. I'm here to fight, and my oncologist is giving me every reason to believe that I'll be able to do that. Well, I'm, an, I'm a cancer doctor, I'm an oncologist, so I take care of cancer patients. We usually get to see them most of the time after they have been diagnosed, because they would present to their regular doctor with some symptoms, say headache or a cough, and those doctors would work them up and they would see a mass or uh, an abnormality and they would usually end up doing a biopsy, which is the most important thing in the diagnosis of cancer out there. And once the biopsy is done and a diagnosis of cancer is established, that's when they get sent to me. And we take it from there, we do the staging, and we talk about the treatment and plan that. Well, we really have three main tools in our arsenal right now, and that's surgery, medical oncology or chemotherapy, and radiation oncology. They all work together. Sometimes you use one of them, sometimes you use two of them, and sometimes you use all three of them. The goals of therapy initially are to remove all of the cancer that we can, so surgery is often the first part of therapy. There's traditional surgery. We now have the da Vinci robotic surgery, which is you know, done a lot for 
uh, men with prostate cancer, and now we're even moving that into the GYN arena and starting to treat women's cancers with the Da Vinci robot. Um, if you have a cancer in a particular spot, the fastest way to get rid of it is cut it out, which a lot of people understand. That just makes a lot of sense. The trouble is, is that there's a lot of cancer you don't see, but chemotherapy goes everywhere. So while you're treating one little spot in an area, you're not treating that spot that you don't know about that's in somebody's liver. And that's what chemotherapy does. It, it takes care of those areas where cancer may be that you just don't know about. We have a lot more new chemotherapy drugs that uh, now that we didn't have many years ago. In terms of chemotherapy, there's traditional chemotherapies. There's also targeted therapies. We used to treat most of the stage two or stage three breast cancer, we'll treat all of them the same. We'll say, you have stage two breast cancer, pick a treatment from a shelf and say, this is the treatment for stage two breast cancer. Now it's different. My breast cancer was a little bit different than most. And so mine was, my chemotherapy was specifically tailored to my type of breast cancer. For each stage two breast cancer, we'll send the tissue for genetic analysis. We'll look out for which genes are active in that particular cancer. And depending on which genes are active or what proteins are present on the surface of that particular cancer determines how we treat them. That has been the biggest change and that's the direction cancer treatment is headed. There are also some great tools that the medical oncology team has to use to help people tolerate their treatment better. People have seen in their families somebody getting chemotherapy and throwing up like crazy with a bucket in their hand. That is a misconception. The supportive treatment of cancer has changed drastically. It's actually uncommon for patients to ever throw up these days because we have the medicines we use to treat cancer or to control the nausea are so good that we can do a pretty good job of, uh, as far as controlling those side effects are concerned. People getting severe anemia from their chemotherapy treatment, you know, there are now drugs that you can take to help boost your cell counts and make you better able to tolerate it. With radiation, it's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. There's a machine called a linear accelerator um, and that delivers external radiation. That's the kind most people are familiar with. You walk in on a daily basis, lay on a table for five minutes, and you get this radiation treatment. The radiation that I deliver, when it passes through DNA, it can, it can damage it, and it can make it more difficult for those cancers then or, to multiply. We're treating a prostate patient here, which I have five different angles on, all aimed at the prostate, and we're trying to minimize the dose to the rectum, bladder, and hips. I'm just giving a cross-sectional view is showing all the different angles I came in with for this one patient. I'm really excited that this fall we're going to have one of the forefront of radiation therapy linear accelerators here to deliver radiation therapy. It has a component called rapid arc that actually speeds the treatment. The idea of being able to be treated in 10 minutes instead of a half an hour, you know, will mean a lot to people getting back to the normalcy of their life and not spending it sitting on a table in a hospital for treatment. I had to go to the doctor and he uh, took a blood sample and he said he's got to refer me to a urologist, Dr. Sazma. Did some tests and he says we had to do something right away. That was on a Tuesday and Friday I was at Sacred Heart. Oh, yeah, they treated me with the robot. You bet. I didn't get to meet him, of course, during surgery, but I knew it was the robot. I heard a lot about him, you know, in the papers and everything like that. And uh, my decision was to have him do it. So I guess I call it to him because Dr. Saz my run him, you know, but uh, just the way to Wisconsin I talks, I guess. He's just a machine with, run by the doctor, you know, just a fine touch. I have six incisions on my midsection. Biggest one is about that long. And if you're gonna have surgery otherwise, they'd probably have to cut you bigger. Doctor watches it and controls that thing and makes an incision and he lasers it so it doesn't bleed. And I healed up real quick, real quick. Up walking the next day, bright and early in the morning. <laughs> Having a family and with grandkids, you know, you wanna, you wanna stick around a while. They say I'm cancer free, which I keep my fingers crossed. And uh, may the God will keep me around here for a while. 
I've had so many patients say that they've had to sit in that parking lot before they could come in the door. They just, they could not have the strength to come through that door. It, they were so scared, they didn't know what the future was. Because being in a cancer center, that's not something anyone wants to do. I used to drive by it, and it just gave me the willies driving by it. And there I was, I was there and I was a patient. Here's what you're gonna expect when you come that first day. Whoever checks in, it doesn't matter. They will get up, leave their desk, and then give them a tour from everything from the patient resource room to where you can get coffee and juices to the entire facility walk through and say, here's where the exam rooms are. This is where you have your labs done, and this is where you're gonna have your, your treatments if that's the case. Many families bring in friends who support them, their spouse, their loved one, or grandparents, their children come in and they spend the day, they play games, they checkers, cards, whatever else needs to be done to get through the day. Some treatments are very quick and short, other treatments take up to six, seven hours. First day I come in there, I told them they got all smile now when I come in. And the second day when I came in, they all... <laughs> they treated everybody special. I know they treat everybody as special. I am certainly wouldn't pick me out of the many hundreds or many thousands, and let's just be special to Jerry. I, I came to just love them. We have patients that are sad when they go to leave because they've, they've developed new family, extended family, they've developed friendships. I always felt so comfortable when I went there that it, it made it easier. I didn't dread going. It truly takes a village to make life after cancer. I think especially here at the Cancer Center, uh, I th we have a great group of people working with us. I'm Marcy Elwood and I'm the oncology social worker. I am a one of five medical oncologists. I'm the survivorship coordinator and chemotherapy nurse at Marshall Clinic Cancer Care. Uh, I'm a radiation oncologist. I'm a senior chaplain here at Sacred Heart. I'm a marriage and family therapist, so I'm a counselor and I work with cancer patients, on um, their families, their children, their grandchildren, their in-laws. I'm a cancer care nurse. We are on the inpatient unit here. It's an oncology specific unit, which is pretty rare in our area of the country. All oncology, every nurse on this unit is chemotherapy certified, and many of us are oncology um, certified, which is a specialty certification. So we give chemotherapy on this floor. We do a lot of supportive care palliative care, end-of-life care on this unit. So uh, we do a little of everything here. I'm a genetic counselor. I work in the Department of Medical Genetic Services. We talk about the genetics of new diagnoses or talk about family history, uh, trying to tease out genetic factors of increased risk for certain medical conditions. So overall, maybe 10% of cancer is genetic. Mostly it's gonna be environmental and mostly it's gonna be a series of changes in that tissue over time. But certainly we can start with the genetics and, and hope to give them a framework to figure out what their screening should be, what organ systems we need to be on the alert for. We actually have research on site. No change is possible without research because when a new drug comes out and it has a potential to treat cancer, we have to first prove that it works. We have 120 open research trials available to patients right here in our community. When a clinical trial is offered, there is a portion of the population, the first thing that comes into their mind is experiment. Am I being a guinea pig? Uh, but we, once we explain the concept to them, most of them are uh, most of them are pretty open to it. We, because for cancer trials, uh, f all of them are getting standard treatment. On top of that, they may get an extra treatment. So this gives our patients a lot more options than they would have otherwise, and they don't have to travel great distances to bigger cities from here, and they can get it right here. They have a program for children called CLIMB. CLIMB stands for Children's Lives Include Moments of Bravery, and it's a way to help educate and support children when their loved one has cancer. We've realized that there's so many patients that are more concerned about what's gonna to happen to their family, their small children. My little Michael, who was um, 10 at the time, just held me and said, I don't want you to die. You can't die, I'm only 10. I think as a parent, 
you feel like you can never do enough for your children, and children are often the silent victims of cancer. My daughter Grace was in the CLIMB program, which, and maybe she can tell you about that. Um, so beneficial. You meet lots of friends, and you talk about how you're feeling, and then you meet lots of new people, and you get to see where everyone gets like chemo and radiation. At the end of the six weeks, we celebrate by having a graduation ceremony. We present the child with a certificate and a little teddy bear, and the families are invited to come, and we really celebrate each child and the progress that they've made in the group. The children are amazing, and they have just such intelligent questions. And, you know, they are going through so much. Sometimes their parents are very ill. They might have a sister that's had surgery and chemotherapy. Parents are gone. They're staying at the hospital. Their whole life is routine is kind of turned upside down. So this is a way to help support them. Yeah, we have dog, we have pet therapy too. Well, I try to bring my dogs about twice a month over to the cancer center in different areas of the hospital here just to see um, the patients and the staff to make them happy, to make them smile, to make them less nervous. Yep, a good boy. Yes, nice you, yep. <laughs> Everybody lights up. They're wonderful. They're cleaner than my kids ever were. They're wonderful, wonderful dogs. This is what they love to do. You know. I came to Sacred Heart Hospital in 1968 as chaplain to especially take care of the spiritual needs of the patients. Father Klimek, he would appear from nowhere, and I'd almost wonder how that would happen. It's not just the pastoral care department that's aware, but the nurses are aware, the support staff who stop me in the hall and say, this person's having a difficult day, would you go in? and see them and visit them. So it's just an awareness of what's going on and that sensitivity. We look upon it as a family. We're all working together with one of the fa our family members who was sick. It just give, gave me the strength knowing that he has seen many, many people in my same situation and they too are survivors. I had a wonderful job, wonderful teaching at a university. Couldn't beat it. Doesn't compare to retirement. Can't be any sweeter than this. And then cancer appears, and cancer is going to scare the pudding out of you. And uh, to find out uh, that night, this might be taken away. And we always make jokes about old people. Well, I'm 69. I qualify as old. But I don't think young people and middle-aged people realize how great old age is. It is sweet. It is so sweet. I have so much compassion for everyone that has gone through it before me. The care that you get now, I can't imagine going through it 20 years ago or even 10 years ago. And I truly believe that by the time my daughter Grace is my age, that there will be a cure and she won't have to go through, through this. This is the most rapidly changing field in medicine. And it's very exciting and very tiring too because you, you get to learn one thing and it changes all of a sudden. I think we're making progress every day. There's just so many exciting things happen, happening in the world of oncology. I always tell my patients, I think, you know, the way we're treating cancer in 30 years, 40 years will be different than what we're doing now. I give this example to my patients. Uh, I was, when I was doing my fellowship, I finished my fellowship in 2002. Um, the way I was trained to treat each cancer, I don't even treat 10% of the cancer the same way. So 90% of the cancers, I treat them completely differently as I was trained uh, because that's how fast the field has changed. Radiation has changed in the last 10 years dramatically. With radiation, it's all about being able to target the tumor better. We've seen the, the risks of serious side effects from radiation literally go down, but we're able to actually increase the dose of radiation, making it more effective in treating those cancers. Cancer used to be basically a black, a black box that we applied chemicals to, at least as a medical oncologist or as a radiation oncologist, you would send radiation through it and hope that it was killed. And it's, what's interesting is really over the last you know, 15 years, what we've learned about cancer, we've peeled back layers looking deeper and deeper into cancer. Now we're down at the molecular level. So now we even, we do have cures that literally affect, affect the molecules of the cancer that tell us to do things. There will be 
uh, careful analysis of what made each individual cancer become cancerous, and then there will be a panel of drugs that are chosen because of what we know about that particular cancer. Individualized treatment, that's what's going to be the way of the future, I think. I always tell my patients, you know, people are looking for a cure for cancer. Um, and it's actually should be plural, cures for cancers, uh, because we've cured some cancers, um, but not all cancers, because they're very different. We're just, just getting into that path, but we've seen you know, dramatic breakthroughs that are helpful to some people, but not the majority of people yet. Because I'm a nurse, I knew some things were changing with my body that weren't supposed to be, and I kind of got them checked out, and we kind of kept checking and checking, and then finally, one of my doctors said, all right, enough, let's just go in and pull out part of it and see if it's something that's not supposed to be, and sure enough, it was. One of the best people I met while I was going through my treatment was my husband. Uh, while I was working in the emergency room, he was down there doing a rotation. And um, Even though I was in the middle, of, or like right at the end of my treatment, um, he still saw me as just me. He didn't see the, the girl who had cancer, the girl who didn't have any hair. When I met Tracy, he has seen me kind of grow and blossom, I guess, through the end of the treatment and the follow-up through radiation and surgeries and things like that. He really kind of helped me see the light at the end of the tunnel and, you know, there was something really that I was fighting for and it was kind of, I was fighting for him all along, but I didn't really know it until I met him. And the rest is history. <laughs> Here at the hospital, here at the clinic together, we truly believe that there is life after cancer. I do believe in life after cancer. And uh, there's nothing more gratifying than having patients come back up here to visit us, which they do very often, five years later, six years later. I've been here for 12 years, so to see them come back is really um, one of the most gratifying things for me in the world, just to see how well they're doing, they're getting back into life, and there definitely is life after cancer. There's too many survivors out there to prove us there is absolutely life after cancer. There's life, um, there's joy, there's sometimes there's sadness, but there's also just joy and lots of opportunity. I've been through a few adversities in my life and I wanna live to enjoy my senior years with the man, my soulmate that I found a few years back and enjoy life. I have three children. They all like to have their mom around. My parents were still living, and I didn't want them to have to bury a child. I want to watch my daughter grow up. I want to grow old with my husband. I've seen our patients go through such difficult times, and our patients are challenged on every level. And uh, it's amazing um, that they can even get themselves up and out of bed and into the clinic some days. And um, they're just really incredible people. Shoot. <laughs> and um, they're, they're, uh, they're my heroes. And I, it's a privilege to walk beside them and help in any way that I can.